Chapter 29 That the Skeptic Way of Thought Differs from the Heraclitean Philosophy Now that this latter differs from our way of thought is plain at once. For Heraclitus makes dogmatic statements about many non-evident things, whereas we, as has been said, do not. It is true that Anasodemus and his followers used to say that the skeptic way is a road leading up to the Heraclitean philosophy, since to hold that the same thing is the subject of opposite appearances is a preliminary to holding that it is the subject of opposite realities. And while the skeptics say that the same thing is the subject of opposite appearances, the Heraclitians go on from this to assert their reality. But in reply to them, we declare that the view about the same thing having opposite appearances is not a dogma of the skeptics, but a fact which is experienced not by skeptics alone, but also by the rest of philosophers and by all mankind. For certainly no one would venture to say that honey does not taste sweet to people in sound health, or that it does not taste bitter to those suffering from jaundice. So that the Heraclitians start from the general preconception of mankind just as we also do, and probably all other philosophies. Consequently, if they had derived their theory that the same thing is the subject of opposite realities from one of the skeptic formulae such as all things are non-apprehensible, or I determine nothing, or some similar expression, probably they would have reached the conclusion they assert. But since their starting points are impressions experienced not by us only, but by all other philosophers and by ordinary people, why should anyone declare that our way of thought is a road to the Heraclitian philosophy any more than any of the other philosophies? Or even that the ordinary view, since we all make use of the same common material? Rather, it is the case that the skeptic way, so far from being an aid to the knowledge of Heraclitian philosophy, is actually an obstacle thereto, seeing that the skeptic decries all the dogmatic statements of Heraclitus as rash utterances, contradicting his ekpyrosis, and contradicting his view that the same thing is the subject of opposite realities, and in respect of every dogma of Heraclitus, scoffing at his dogmatic precipitancy and constantly repeating, as I said before, his own, I apprehend not, and I determine nothing, which are in conflict with the Heraclitians. Now, it is absurd to say that a conflicting way is a road to the system with which it is in conflict. Therefore, it is absurd to say that the skeptic way is a road leading to the Heraclitian philosophy. Chapter 30 Wherein the skeptic way differs from the Democritean philosophy. But it is also said that the Democritean philosophy has something in common with skepticism, since it seems to use the same material as we. For, from the fact that honey appears sweet to some and bitter to others, Democritus, as they say, infers that it is really neither sweet nor bitter, and pronounces in consequence the formula not more, which is a skeptic formula. The skeptics, however, and the school of Democritus, employ the expression not more in different ways, for while they use it to express the unreality of either alternative, we express by it our ignorance as to whether both or neither of the appearances is real, so that in this respect also we differ, and our difference becomes specially evident when Democritus says, but in verity atoms and void, for he says in verity in place of in truth, and that he differs from us when he says that the atoms and the void are in truth subsistent, Although he starts out from the incongruity of appearances, it is superfluous, I think, to state. Chapter 31, wherein skepticism differs from Cyrenicism. Some assert that the Cyreniac doctrine is identical with skepticism, since it too affirms that only mental states are apprehended. But it differs from skepticism inasmuch as it says that the end is pleasure, and the smooth motion of the flesh, whereas we say 
it is quietude, which is the opposite of their end. For whether pleasure be present or not present, the man who positively affirms pleasure to be the end undergoes perturbations, as I have argued in my chapter of the end. Further, whereas we suspend judgment so far as regards the essence of external objects, the Cyreniacs declare that those objects possess a real nature which is inapprehensible. Chapter 32, wherein skepticism differs from the Protagorean doctrine. Protagoras also holds that man is the measure of all things, of existing things that they exist, and of non-existing things that they exist not. And by measure he means the criterion, and by things the objects, so that he is virtually asserting that man is the criterion of all objects, of those which exist, that they exist, and of those which exist not, that they exist not. And consequently, he posits only what appears to each individual, and thus he introduces relativity. And for this reason, he seems also to have something in common with the Pyrrhonians. Yet he differs from them, and we shall perceive the difference when we have adequately explained the views of Protagoras. What he states then is this, that matter is in flux, and as it flows, additions are made continuously in the place of the effluxions, and the senses are transformed and altered according to the times of life and to all the other conditions of the bodies. He says also that the reasons of all the appearances subsist in matter, so that matter, so far as depends on itself, is capable of being all those things which appear to all. And men, he says, apprehend different things at different times, owing to their differing dispositions. For he who is in a natural state apprehends those things subsisting in matter, which are able to appear to those in a natural state, and those who are in a non-natural state, the things which can appear to those in a non-natural state. Moreover, precisely the same account applies to the variations due to age, and to the sleeping or waking state, and to each several kind of condition. Thus, according to him, man becomes the criterion of real existences, for all things that appear to men also exist, and things that appear to no man have no existence either. We see, then, that he dogmatizes about the fluidity of matter, and also about the subsistence therein of the reasons of all appearances, these being non-evident matters about which we suspend judgment. Chapter 33, wherein skepticism differs from the academic philosophy. Some indeed say that the academic philosophy is identical with skepticism. Consequently, it shall be our next task to discuss this statement. According to most people, there have been three academies, the first and most ancient, that of Plato and his school, the second or middle academy, that of Arcesilaus, the pupil of Palamo, and his school, the third or new academy, that of the school of Carneades and Clytomachus. Some, however, add as a fourth that of the school of Philo and Charmidas, and some even count the school of Antiochus as a fifth. Beginning then with the old academy, let us consider how the philosophies mentioned differ from ours. Plato has been described by some as dogmatic, by others as dubitative, and by others again as partly dogmatic and partly dubitative. For in his exercitatory discourses, where Socrates is introduced either as talking playfully with his auditors or as arguing against sophists, he shows, they say, an exercitatory and dubitative character, but a dogmatic character when he is speaking seriously by the mouth, either of Socrates or of Timaeus or of some similar personage. Now as regards those who describe him as a dogmatist, or as partly dogmatic and partly dubitative, it would be superfluous to say anything now. 
for they themselves acknowledge his difference from us. But the question whether Plato is a genuine skeptic is one which we discuss more fully in our commentaries, but now in opposition to Menodotus and Anasidemus, these being the chief champions of this view. We declare in brief that when Plato makes statements about ideas or about the reality of providence or about the virtuous life being preferable to the vicious, he is dogmatizing. If he is assenting to these as actual truths, while if he is accepting them as more probable than not, since thereby he gives a preference to one thing over another in point of probability or improbability, he throws off the character of a skeptic. For that such an attitude is foreign to us is quite plain from what has been said above. And if Plato does really utter some statements in a skeptical way, when he is, as they say, exercising, that will not make him a skeptic. For the man that dogmatizes about a single thing or ever prefers one impression to another in point of credibility or incredibility, or makes any assertion about any non-evident objects, assumes the dogmatic character, as Timon also shows by his remarks about Xenophanes. For after praising him repeatedly, so that he even dedicated to him his satires, he represented him as uttering this lamentation. Would that I too had attained a mind compacted of wisdom, both ways casting my eyes, but the treacherous pathway deceived me, old that I was, and as yet unversed in the doubts of the skeptic. For in whatever direction I turned my mind in its questing, all was resolved into one and the same, all ever existing into one self-same nature, returning shaped itself all ways. So on this account, he also calls him semi-vain and not perfectly free from vanity, where he says, Xenophanes, semi-vain, derider of Homer's deceptions, framed him a god far other than man, self-equal in all ways, safe from shaking or scathe, surpassing thought in his thinking. He called him semi-vain as being in some degree free from vanity and derider of Homer's deceptions because he censured the deceit mentioned in Homer. Xenophanes, contrary to the preconceptions of all other men, asserted dogmatically that the all is one and that God is consubstantial with all things and is of spherical form and passionless and unchangeable and rational and from this it is easy to show how Xenophanes differs from us. However, it is plain from what has been said that even if Plato evinces doubt about some matters, yet he cannot be a skeptic inasmuch as he shows himself at times either making assertions about the reality of non-evident objects or preferring one non-evident thing to another in point of credibility. The adherents of the new academy, although they affirm that all things are non-apprehensible, yet differ from the skeptics even, as seems probable, in respect of this very statement that all things are non-apprehensible, for they affirm this positively, whereas the skeptic regards it as possible that some things may be apprehended, but they differ from us quite plainly in their judgment of things good and evil. For the academicians do not describe a thing as good or evil in the way we do, for they do so with the conviction that it is more probable that what they call good is really good, rather than the opposite, and so too in the case of evil, whereas when we describe a thing as good or evil, we do not add it as our opinion that what we assert is probable but simply conform to life undogmatically that we may not be precluded from activity. And as regards sense impressions, we say that they are equal in respect of probability and improbability so far as their essence is concerned, whereas they assert that some impressions are probable, others improbable. And respecting the probable impressions, they make distinctions some they regard as just simply probable, others as probable and tested, others as probable, tested, and irreversible.
For example, when a rope is lying coiled up in a dark room, to one who enters hurriedly it represents the simply probable appearance of being a serpent. But to the man who has looked carefully round, as has investigated the conditions, such as its immobility and its color, and each of its other peculiarities, it appears as a rope, in accordance with an impression that is probable and tested. And the impression that is also irreversible or incontrovertible is of this kind. When Alcestis had died, Heracles, it is said, brought her up again from Hades and showed her to Admetus, who received an impression of Alcestis that was probable and tested. Since, however, he knew that she was dead, his mind recoiled from its ascent and reverted to unbelief. So then the philosophers of the new academy prefer the probable and tested impression to the simply probable, and to both of these the impression that is probable and tested and irreversible. And although both the academics and the skeptics say that they believe some things, yet here too the difference between the two philosophies is quite plain. For the word believe has different meanings. It means not to resist, but simply to follow without any strong impulse or inclination, as the boy is said to believe his tutor. But sometimes it means to assent to a thing of deliberate choice, and with a kind of sympathy due to strong desire, as when the incontinent man believes him who approves of an extravagant mode of life. Since therefore Carneades and Clytomachus declare that a strong inclination accompanies their credence and the credibility of the object, while we say that our belief is a matter of simple yielding without any consent, here too there must be a difference between us and them. Furthermore, as regards the end or aim of life, we differ from the new academy. For whereas the men who profess to conform to its doctrine use probability as the guide of life, we live in an undogmatic way by following the laws, customs, and natural affections. And we might say still more about this distinction had it not been that we are aiming at conciseness. Arcesilaus, however, who was, as we said, the president and founder of the Middle Academy, certainly seems to me to have shared the doctrines of Pyrrho, so that his way of thought is almost identical with ours. For we do not find him making any assertion about the reality or unreality of anything, nor does he prefer any one thing to another in point of probability or improbability, but suspends judgment about all. He also says that the end is suspension, which is accompanied, as we have said, by quietude. He declares, too, that suspension regarding particular objects is good, but assent regarding particulars bad. Only one might say that whereas we make these statements not positively, but in accordance with what appears to us, he makes them as statements of real facts, so that he asserts that suspension in itself really is good, and assent bad. And if one ought to credit also what is said about him, he appeared at the first glance, they say, to be a Pyrrhonian, but in reality was a dogmatist. And because he used to test his companions by means of dubitation to see if they were fitted by nature for the reception of the Platonic dogmas, he was thought to be a dubitative philosopher, but he actually passed on to such of his companions as were naturally gifted the dogmas of Plato. And this was why Ariston described him as Plato the head of him, Pyrrho the tail, in the midst Diodorus, because he employed the dialectic of Diodorus, although he was actually a Platonist. Philo asserts that objects are inapprehensible so far as concerns the Stoic criterion, that is to say, apprehensive impression, but are apprehensible so far as concerns the real nature of the objects themselves. Moreover, Antiochus actually transferred the Stoa to the academy so that it was even said of him that in the academy he teaches the Stoic philosophy, for he tried to show that the dogmas of the Stoics are already present in Plato. 
so that it is quite plain how the skeptic way differs from what is called the fourth academy and the fifth. Chapter 34. Whether medical empiricism is the same as skepticism. Since some allege that the skeptic philosophy is identical with empiricism of the medical sect, it must be recognized that inasmuch as that empiricism positively affirms the inapprehensibility of what is non-evident, it is not identical with skepticism, nor would it be consistent in a skeptic to embrace that doctrine. He could more easily, in my opinion, adopt the so-called method, for it alone of the medical systems appears to avoid rash treatment of things non-evident by arbitrary assertions as to their apprehensibility or non-apprehensibility, and following appearances derives from them what seems beneficial in accordance with the practice of the skeptics. For we stated above that the common life in which the skeptic also shares is fourfold, one part depending on the directing force of nature, another on the compulsion of the affections, another on the tradition of laws and customs, and another on the training of the arts. So then, just as the skeptic, in virtue of the compulsion of the affections, is guided by thirst to drink and by hunger to food, and in like manner to other such objects, in the same way the methodical physician is guided by the pathological affections to the corresponding remedies, by contraction to dilation, as when one seeks refuge in heat from the contraction due to the application of cold, or by fluxion to the stoppage of it, as when persons in a hot bath, dripping with perspiration and in a relaxed condition, seek to put a stop to it, and for this reason rush off into the cool air. And it is plain, too, that the conditions which are naturally alien compel us to take measures for their removal, seeing that even the dog, when it is pricked by a thorn, proceeds to remove it, and in short, to avoid exceeding the limits proper to an outline of this kind by a detailed enumeration, I suppose that all the facts described by the methodic school can be classed as instances of the compulsion of the affections, whether natural or against nature. Besides, the use of terms in an undogmatic and indeterminate sense is common to both systems. For just as the skeptic uses the expressions, I determine nothing and I apprehend nothing, as we have said, in an undogmatic sense, even so the methodic speaks of generality and pervade and the like in a non-committal way. So also he employs the term indication in an undogmatic sense to denote the guidance derived from the apparent affections or symptoms, both natural and contranatural, for the discovery of the seemingly appropriate remedies, as in fact I mentioned in regard to hunger and thirst and in other affections. Consequently, judging from these and similar indications, we should say that the methodic school of medicine has some affinity with skepticism, and when viewed not simply by itself, but in comparison with the other medical schools, it has more affinity than they. And now that we have said thus much concerning the schools, which seem to stand nearest to that of the skeptics, we here bring to a conclusion both our general account of skepticism and the first book of our Outlines. <laughs>